All right, so um, I'm going to get started with our next session so that we don't run out of time. This is an important session. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jennifer Troyer. I am the director of our Division of Extramural Operations. Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see you all. Thank you for coming. And Lisa, thank you so much for giving me genetics. It's complicated because I feel like that's what I've been saying my whole life and my whole career. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our own David Adams from NHGRI, who has um, done lots of work on rare diseases in our undiagnosed diseases program here intramurally and is going to kick us off with a lot of great thoughts. Thank you very much. So as is the nature of these things, um, many of my uh, wonderful ideas were articulated during the early sessions. So hopefully this will build on those to some extent. And I think that uh, I'm hoping that this will, this session will be a nice, uh, create a nice transition to the next session talking about functional analysis because, oh, you need to stand in the microphone. Uh, I see. Thank you. That's right. Uh, functional analysis, because I think that complicated uh, genetic mechanisms are intrinsically tied to functional analysis, especially when you're figuring them out for, uh, for families. Oh, great. Okay. I was a pediatric chief resident at one point and nobody tells you that it's about 20% of the job is getting people's presentations working. So, um, I see there may be some font, uh, transitions here. So sorry about that, but I started off by thinking about this topic by going to the webpage for this, uh, workshop and noted that uh, one of the goals was to talk about the genetic causes of conditions with a, um, to increase the solve rate for rare disease. And this is something I'm particularly interested in working with uh, undiagnosed diseases in my own environment. So starting at the, at the beginning, I guess we're talking about anything that's Mendelian plus somatic, undiagnosed patients or disorders that don't have a known gene yet. And I think as came out through the conversations in the morning, most of these are gonna be rare. So this group of starting uh, material splits pretty nicely into two different categories. One are known disease gene associations, and then we're really talking about a delayed di diagnosis, right? So it's something that you should be able to diagnose given existing technology, but for some reason it's taking you longer than we would hope that it would for the family's sake. And then the other half is new, um, uh, new gene or variant disease associations. And in this case, we've got something in hand, but we need some extra steps to validate it. And if we think about the proportions of each of these, there, of course, there are many estimates, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and these may or may not be your favorite. But if we think about the number of genetic diseases, and that one estimate is 10,000 uh, known diseases, Omen breaks this down in a couple of different ways, as, as Nara could tell us. But so you would say that these are about half and uh, half and half. The reason I mentioned this and, and illustrate this division is that there are some different considerations for these two groups. So for the no disease genes, I think it's worth saying, just as you would when talking about public health and uh, shelter and water and food, that really the biggest problem here looked at at a global scale is test access and timely referral and Inequity, implementation, and system failures are really what keep the technology from the uh, patients in most cases. But from a biologist's point of view, there are some interesting complications, atypical phenotypes and unusual mechanisms, for instance. For new, uh, for new diseases or new variant associations, we start to get into things that were more connected to what we've talked about earlier in the day, which is reference data, and that could be genome references or the metadata that goes with them. It was interesting talking about how to propagate the, the discussion this morning about how to propagate variants over time. And I think one of the biggest challenges there is keeping the metadata up to date because it changes so uh, quickly. Um, the state of basic science, cohort availability, and getting experts together all go along with this, this bottom limb. But I think for it's complicated today, we can take pieces from both of those and uh, create a few categories. So one is complex or atypical alleles. And every time I talk to a colleague, I hear some new interesting story about a different type of allele or genetic mechanism that, that they've uh, unearthed. Um, these are typically missed by standard assays. They often require functional validation, which I'll talk about a little bit in more next session. And uh, it may be that they are require 
esoteric assays that have limited availability in a clinical uh, in a clinical scope. I have just a couple of examples from my work, and these certainly are not among the most complex uh, that I know about. But one example is this is um, uh, I, I'm interested in disorders of pigmentation, and tyrosinase is one of the genes that causes ocular cutaneous albinism. It's one of the two most common causes, and the most common hypomorph is actually a uh, haplotype, which requires the minor allele of two common SNP sites to be present as markers. That defines the allele. It's not clear exactly what the uh, individual contributions of these are to the uh, dysfunction of the allele, but um, they're far enough apart that it's not picked up with regular diagnostic strategies and therefore actually leaves many people undiagnosed after getting uh, typical uh, molecular testing. Here's another example from the other most common gene for albinism, OCA2. And uh, you'll probably recognize that there's some uh, dosage step-offs here in this plot of uh, depth of coverage for short read. And uh, we disentangled this, and it's the result of multiple events, including deletions and inversions. Again, it's not picked up on exome, but it's picked up if you use any one of a number of uh, structural variant um, methodologies. So I think we could all come up with our own rogues gallery of interesting, unusual diagnostic mechanisms. And this is continuing to grow. It's important for our understanding for biology. Um, and I've listed just a few categories here. But I think that a point that I'm going to come back to a couple of times is the fact that we started off with a technology genome or exome that's pretty much universally useful for ascertaining um, potential genetic causes. And, you know, a success rate of 30% is pretty impressive compared to what we had before that. And we saw an era of a huge number of new diagnoses and, uh, uh, and gene associations when that technology was rolled out. These days, we have a whole slew of technologies which tend to solve a smaller number of cases. So in my own experience, we've got a group of about a thousand families that we've deeply phenotyped and, and visited with. And uh, every time a new technology comes out, we apply it to the cohort and it solves a few cases. And then another technology comes out and it solves a few, uh, few cases. So at this point, I'm gonna go through and just talk about a few ideas which we could discuss or not as a group. Um, it, for some of these uh, difficult alleles, they will get to the point where you can use a common test platform. And I think one potential area for NIH to invest in is improving the a speed with which some of those tests become available clinically. So there have been several in the in the last few years. I think uh, we talked about epigenetics this morning. In the U.S., you can order an EpiSign test, which covers about 90 conditions, clearly not keeping up with uh, this morning's speakers. And um, for optical genome mapping, there's a test, uh, a test now that's available. Um, I, these are all just examples. I'm not endorsing any of them, of course. The uh, medical neurogenetics now LabCorp uh, transcriptome was an early clinical transcriptome. And I think the interesting thing about this is it was a, a test that you would often use when you had a strong hypothesis. So you, find, you found that you had a non-coding variant and you might go to this test so that you had a clinical report to give back to the family. But many tests are not uh, making this transition to a clinical test. And one could argue that, for instance, for transcriptome, there's a long way to go still. And so... Areas of investment include um, understanding the frequency and demand for these tests, how they could be generalized into a standard platform, and um, control av availability and uh, development of, of standards. In terms of research, one of the things that I thought we might talk about this morning, if there's interest, is multi-omic visualization. So the first time that I loaded up a genome and an RNA-seq together in the same IGV view. I thought, wow, this is great. I'm, and I could really line things up and um, appreciate multiple signals at the same time. And I think we've talked about proteomics this morning. We've talked about epigenomics. We've talked about chromosome configurations. Being able to look at all of this uh, stuff uh, uh, clearly and to be able to correlate what's happening um, and have standard data sets, you know, we all hope that eventually this will look like DICOM, um, is going to be uh, important and hopefully an, a, an area for research investment. Um, funding for single case functional validation, I'm going to sort of leave that for the next group of speakers, but I think uh, reference standards are something which are, are sorely missed, I think, in the, 
uh, for us anyway, when we're trying to evaluate some of these new data sets. So here's an example of a, a recent, what I would call a success is, is that uh, Danny Miller and the uh, University of Washington and colleagues to use nanopore sequencing for uh, 1000 genomes project samples. But really, I think what we all want at the end of the day a representative, quantitative, normative data so we can tell what's normal variation and what's uh, um, exceptional. And I think that this really requires um, uh, some investment to, to get done. Um, some of these tools we've talked about this morning, uh, one of the bold predictions that came out of the um, NHGRI um, process of kind of envisioning what the future would look like was that the uh, biologic function of every human gene will be known by 2030 or whatever they put. So very ambitious. Um, we have tools that we uh, use for this. So OMIM is clearly a place that we go to look for these associations. And uh, Heidi was kindly kind enough to tell me about the GenCC, which we've been really looking at uh, carefully since she told us about it. And one nice thing about this project is, is that they're using a standard to evaluate the strength of evidence um, for these gene disease associations. But I would argue that this isn't going fast enough. I think the, the amount of resources we have for variant curation and for, uh, for gene cur curation are just um, lagging behind the need. And I think that the, the best way to express this is the fact that you can't really use the ACMG variant criteria if you don't have an adequate gene disease association um, established. So I think that this is, again, another potential area for investment. Um, so for these very rare variants, it may be that when you first encounter them, or complex variants in particular, you just can't interpret them. There's not enough information. So you may only be able to understand their significance in the context of reanalysis. So, uh, you know, writ large, this is really genome data is a lifelong resource, which, you know, we can include PRSs and all of the other uh, things that you could use that data for. But I think that uh, the field is struggling a little bit to come up with really robust reanalysis standards. It's being done different ways by different providers. And then also there were some discussion this, this morning that I think that would be good to build on about how the data is stored. So I think we're you know, moving these things around from place to place. You know, For Paul, it's great that the family can ask to have their BAM file, but I think that that's not a model that's easy to generalize for medical care. I think we're moving to a place where we're going to have centralized storage of the data like the uh, Seeker project that Heidi was talking about earlier. And so how do we make sure that that looks that that meets some adequate standards across healthcare so we don't generate uh, inequities? Um, the uh, This is just uh, I'll point out this um, build on this some more in just a second, but I think one of the challenges for a practicing clinician is how do we build pathways from the clinic to the laboratory? So if you have something that looks like an interesting gene or an interesting variant, how do you engage the research community to be able to, to validate that? And a classic example, which I just use this to illustrate, is when you only find one variant um, in a coding region, the second variant is in a non-coding region, and you need to do additional laboratory tests, in this case, RNA-seq, to find uh, the second variant. So this is my last my last slide. I think we are in a place where we are using, at least in the clinical realm, survey methodologies. We look uh, at genomes and we look at exomes. If we find something we recognize or we can interpret, that's, that's great. Um, and uh, optical genome mapping was probably in this category and using some older technologies, which we could list, but I put SNP arrays there as a placeholder. But I think where we need to go next is you find an interesting target, and then there's a mechanism for the clinician to pursue that target and to do uh, deep um, exploration of whether that solves the case. Now, it's great to think about large data sets that try to cover as much space as possible, saturation, mutagenesis. But for all of the reasons that were discussed this morning, that space is very, very large. And I think in the near future, um, the follow-on to our being able to find candidates is going to be our ability to create infrastructure to follow up on the candidates and be able to understand how they are relevant for a person's health and disease. Models exist for this. I think Gregor and our undiagnosed disease program, there are others that, that, that do this type of work, but generalization needs new strategies and there are both technical and implementation challenges to get there. Thank you.
Great. Thank you for setting the stage. And um, now, and thank you for my panelists for finding your way up here. I appreciate that. Um, and so Gary Cutting from Johns Hopkins is going to give us his thoughts. And I hope I'm... Well, when I saw the title, uh, genetics is complicated, I just said, yes, it is. <laughs> And it's genetics because genetics is the composite, right, of, of both genome variation, environmental effects, stochastic effects, and everything else that we talked about earlier. And I just pulled one thing out because I work, and I just say, I'm old school. I'm still working on the same gene 30 years later. The same one I said, we'll get this wrapped up in five years. And my postdocs from that time have moved on. Quite a bit have said you were so wrong on that one. And in fact, my my, my mentor, Hopkins, uh, hey, Kazazian, told me that, you know, we still haven't solved a lot about globin, and globin is three exons, right? So so I, I naively thought back then that it would be relatively simple. It was a Mendelian disorder. So what should be so complicated about the whole thing? Well, everything you mentioned there, David, all those different mechanisms, and one of the ones that really is starting to get us because we work on modifiers a modifier variants and trying to think of how to put the whole thing together, both intergenic and extragenic modifiers, is sort of us building from Mendelian disease towards, I think, more complex uh, multigenic disorders. And sooner or later, we do need to deliver to the public uh, something more on the multigenic disorders. Uh, uh, type 2 diabetes, I think, of one of the ones that I know we've got low psi. We've got many of them, and yet still we really haven't, of course, I forgot about Ozempic, but anyway, um, but there, we really haven't developed a lot yet from, from that, if you really stand back and think of what Mendelian diseases deliver a, a single target. And certainly in CF, with a single target, we have been fortunate by going deep to get drugs that really work well. And soon we will have gene therapy, I think, within the next few years for CF, either lung-directed or we'll have a systemic or a combination of the two. And I think that will set the stage for what's going to happen in genetics in general because we already see the success with sickle cell disease and everything else. But to do those and to get those therapies, we had to constantly recheck the pathophysiology and the molecular biology. Are we correct? So going back and using the variants as a way to interrogate the, the way in which that gene was operating, how the variants affected function, to do them in cell-based systems, do them in animal models, there are now eight animal models for CF, cystic fibrosis, is, yes, it's probably something not a lot of other diseases can afford to do, but what is it showing you? It's showing you that by going very, very deep in one disorder, where we've learned things and what was useful, and in some cases, what wasn't useful. So I, I think like anything else, uh, a deep interrogation gives you information that should be valuable and we should be required to translate that for a more common uh, uh, approach to, to other conditions. Because I don't see, if I take out Delta F508, the common variant, and several of the other somewhat common variants, see if it becomes a rare disease, as rare as many others. And it's got a bunch of variants, just like all those other rare diseases. So we're almost working in the rare disease space now because we're working with individuals in which there's one or two people worldwide that carry the same variant. Because we have a database of 123,000 individuals with CF, with clinical data. We have everything you just saw up there. We also have functional data on a lot of things. We have all those animal models and we have a ton of information. And still, this is one of the distillations, this idea of the complex allele and you use it in one way, I'll use it in slightly different. In that now we're faced with how do we put the genome together if we start with the monogenic situation and work out. So we're going backwards and forwards on what are the different components if you start looking at common or rare alleles as I shown you probably had time to read up there and how do we put those together particularly with the modifiers now being brought into the equation and then the possible effects right because modifiers can not only make things potentially worse more severe they can ameliorate effects and we've got some good examples of ameliorating effects the modifiers and you can imagine an ameliorating effect that may be so profound that the disease causing variant itself is no longer penetrant and we have that we think in cases of male infertility, which happens with defects in CFTR, and there are some counteracting. Whoops, there goes my tent. Counteracting things. So um, I'm, I'm, I've only distilled. I haven't even talked about synonymous variants. Synonymous variants, right? Yeah, no big deal. But if it changes the codon usage to a rare tRNA, it slows down the rate of translation. And for complex folded polytopic proteins, that's a problem. Because if it slows it down during a certain phase, now you get misfolding defects, 
that weren't apparent in the wild type version of that protein. Um, by the same token, you can also, and we, we've discovered this and so have others, um, you can get changes of a couple of nucleotides in the intron. And what does that do? If it's near a splice site, it can shift the stem loop structure so it's more stable. And the stem loop structure then in interferes with the ability of that site to be recognized as a splice site. So why would an extra TG dinucleotide set change things around? Well, that's so again, there's more mechanisms to be discovered. That's just a snippet of the ones we have. It is complicated, but I'll, I'll end up here. Just because it's complicated doesn't mean we can't figure it out. If we put enough effort into it, and, we, and the NIH and foundations, like the CIA Foundation and other, I would say, I, I, I'll just make a point here about calling individuals with conditions patients. As a physician, a patient is someone to me who's in the hospital. And we've got a lot of feedback from our uh, individuals with CF, they're people, they're persons. So in our field now, we call them persons with CF or individuals with CF. We do not call them a CF patient. And I, I understand from their point of view, and I'm not saying everyone should change right away, it's just the feedback we've got. So from those individuals, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we've now I've lost my earlier point. Now we've con <laughs> continued to learn. Anyway, I'll wrap up and finish here. That it is complex. We can keep, keep digging in with foundation help from uh, individuals who uh, and families who have the condition and other locations. You can get the resources to do it. And so uh, I think we just have to take on that charge and recognize. I think you made that point, David. You got to go in depth for some of these to really solve them. And uh, there's just at this point. I don't think a, a simple way to do this. Just put the effort in and you'll get it done. All right, Lennis Laxton, do you wanna tell us your version of complicated? <laughs> yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Glennis Laxton and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania in genetics. And I also am a core member of the Penn Epigenetics Institute. And today I kind of want to draw your attention to the regions of the human genome that have been historically overlooked in genetic variation analyses, but may in fact actually cause disease. So in 2022, I and others in the Telomere to Telomere Consortium uncovered around 8% of the human genome, which had been left out of previous efforts to identify disease causing variants. And these regions are shown here in blue, and they include the centromeres, segmental duplications, tandem repeats such as VNTRs, STRs, and rDNA arrays, as well as the telomeres. And even though these regions have been considered historically as junk DNA, they're really not. They're anything but junk. Um, they have essential functions. For example, the centromeres are absolutely essential for making sure our chromosomes segregate accurately to daughter cells. And they contain genes like the segmental duplications, which have been shown to be important for human evolution, speciation, and the development of our brain. So although these regions are typically thought to be devoid of disease-causing variants, I think we need to start considering them more seriously. Um, we're finding now that genetic and epigenetic variation within them can actually cause disease. And as one example, I wanted to draw your attention to the centromeres, which are the region of the genome that I, I study. Um, centromeres, for those of you who don't know, are these large repetitive regions that are found on every chromosome and make sure we can segregate our chromosomes accurately. But um, we're finding that these regions, because of their repetitive nature, undergo homologous recombination. They have duplications, deletions that actually can impact the location of the kinetic core, which makes that at attachment to spindle mic uh, microtubules during meiosis. So we're finding that if there is a deleterious variant within a centromere, it can actually lead to chromosome missegregation that leads to, for example, trisomy disorders or monosomy disorders. And there's a whole host of possibilities for it in, in infertility and in miscarriages, as well as in cancer. So this is just one region of the genome that I think, you know, along with the other 8% um, that we really should focus on when we look at genetic variation and try to understand its role in disease. Hey, Sarah from Boston Children's, you're up next. Hey, thanks so much. And thank you for having me here today. Um, so I was a developmental biologist as a graduate student, and that led me to become a neonatologist because it's amazing to be a part of early human development. But it was that clinical experience that actually brought me to genomics as a research field, right? Uh, because you can see how important it is to understand for a family, for a, an individual patient, um, if there is uh, an explanatory uh, underlying cause such as a genetic variant. And so my own version of complexity is congenital heart disease, right? And so it's, it's estimated that there's about 400 genes that can contribute to congenital heart disease. And any given variant 
can cause numerous forms of congenital heart disease. So it's all, it's the like many by many mm -hmm. uh, uh, comparison that no one wants to do, right? To try <laughs> to find these, these underlying causes. If we look clinically, and so this pie chart is for um, infants born. It depends also if you looked at prenatal testing, each of these percentages might shift a little bit. Um, but you know, we have some sort of genetic contribution in about half of individuals with congenital heart disease who come through the combination of clinical testing or research-based testing. But some of these uh, triangles, very appropriately the one in gray, is actually not a diagnosis, right? That's an excess number of single nucleotide variants or insertion deletions that are found among individuals with congenital heart disease. That is not a diagnosis for that individual, right? It's just that we've ascribed genetic risk to that proportion um, of participants with congenital heart disease. And so uh, that's just to illustrate one of the many types of complexities that I've tried to look at. Um, and this is actually the list of all the things we've tried to look at with our cohort. Um, and each of them brings about a different kind of hurdle to overcome. And so reference uh, cohorts are amazing for understanding what's a rare variant and what's not, but you can't always use them to identify the variants that you want to study in your cohort because there can be nuances to the sequencing technicalities or sample preparation where we'll see that our rates of variance at certain loci, right, um, will be very different if a cohort is jointly called with ours versus just used as an external reference. Mm -hmm. And so there's all of these levels of thinking about what's the evidence you use when our big cohorts um, useful for identifying rare versus truly detecting burden of a particular gene or genetic loci with your uh, condition you're studying. Um, so we've, uh, we often look at variants of uncertain significance uh, in disease genes. We use tools like alpha missense um, to try to prioritize. But if you look at the alpha fold structure for CHD7, the gene that causes charge, known disease gene, alpha folds about 100 amino acids. The gene is about 3,000. Right, so when you look at the matchup between ClinVar pathogenicity and alpha missense, it's actually quite poor. Whereas for many other genes, CFTR, it does a much better job. Right, there's more evidence there, um, and so I think that there are specific knowledge gaps um, that we can address by improving some of the underlying data uh, that that help with our training. Um, uh, there's a lot of novel disease genes. Tools like Matchmaker are amazing for finding those things. But imagine if what you focused on was you had everyone's epigenomic profile. What if we could define new, um, new different conditions that are actually grouped more by their, what we would consider metadata now than their primary phenotypic code. As a clinician, I bill. I would never want you to diagnose someone based on my billing practices, right? Uh, my hospital gives me a, 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 pro, like a prescribed set of ICD codes that I use preferentially. Those might not match best with other institutions, mm -hmm. let alone with my patient's actual health state. Um, so those are the things I think about. What do I wake up at night so concerned about that there's two variants in two different genes causing this condition? And if I'm only modeling them in cardiomyocytes, have I assessed the function of those two genes together, right? Like, how do you think about this real complexity, not just the complex genetic structures, but the cells, tissues, developmental time points that they all might be acting in that actually results in the, uh, the condition that we want to understand better? All right, Melissa Wilson from Arizona State University, I think has an even different perspective on what the complexity <laughs> might entail. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I want to, my <laughs> hobby horse or soapbox is <laughs> sex as a biological variable is multimodal. And um, I think Glennis was excellent in introducing this 8% of the genome that we didn't know about, so you all could be forgiven for excluding, but uh, <laughs> roughly 5% of the genome, five to six with the X and Y are, routinely excluded from genomics analyses still as a first quality control step in a lot of studies. And when, yeah. <laughs> Why I think this is especially important is that we, we know we were discussing over lunch is that what is typical genetic variation is something we're still getting a handle on. And that you can have variation in the genetics in, in terms of sex chromosome complement you can have variation in reproductive hormones. You can have variation in gonad development that people are born with. Variation in all of these changes over time. And, and my lab largely studies the variation in sex chromosome complement and variant calling there. Um, in, and I think this is relevant for disease diagnosis in a couple 
ways. One, individuals can lose sex chromosomes as they age and do, right? And do lose them as they age and lose them in cancer or have duplications of them in cancer. We're finding exist, which is a gene that should only be expressed in individuals to two X chromosomes, expressed in cancers from XY individuals. And we're finding in cell lines that roughly 40% of cancer cell lines, the CCLE cell lines, um, have atypical sex chromosome complement, either in the expression of exist or loss of Y chromosome or partial loss of Y chromosome that is contributing to some of this variation. And I think one of the reasons that's particularly important is that genes, gene expression variants on the sex chromosomes regulate autosomal variation. There's been some really cool work in animal models showing that just based on the Y chromosome haplotype in fruit flies, for example, you can modify autosomal expression tremendously based on different variants that are present on the Y chromosome, which is, as much as the X is excluded, the Y is just completely left out. And I, and I say that we don't have methods for it. And so some of the, what we do is work on methodology. Um, but I also think there's a lot of assumptions people have, even, even when intentionally looking at sex chromosome complement variation. So for example, individuals with Turner syndrome, people with Turner syndrome, right? Uh, <laughs> roughly half of the time we're finding now, so it's nearly all mosaic. I love the mosaicism Sarah pointed out. Uh, roughly half of the time that is due to missing Y chromosome, just as often as missing X chromosome. And so we finding pieces of the X or pieces of the Y and each of those will affect the autosomal variation and the manifestation of the phenotype in those patients. And then if we think about what's the typical variation and then how does that layer onto disease phenotypes? I think we're kind of, um, I'm in Arizona, we're like a Grand Canyon away <laughs> from understanding how sex is a biological variable layers on top of these disease diagnosis. But I hope that we can continue to, to keep that in mind and at least not filter out the sex chromosomes as a quality control step. Great, thank you. So I think it, actually, Melissa, you, you mentioned assumptions. And I think one of the things that we wanna talk about in this, uh, this session is what are those underlying assumptions that maybe were projecting and need to get past? Um, and do we need to change our, our analytical models, revisit them, thinking about different modes of inheritance, the, com the complexity of all these different um, axes that, that everybody has talked about. Um, and so if each of you can talk a little bit about what do you think we're missing? Um, in our in in how we're approaching these questions, who wants to start? Go ahead. <laughs> I have two big things I think we're missing. One is just variants on the sex chromosomes at all. Actually, <laughs> because of the way that we align reference genomes, we we are undercalling variation, undercalling transcript abundance. Very likely, we haven't looked at epigenetics, but I'm guessing we mess up there also just because of the assumptions of how we use a reference genome. So we're just mm -hmm. flat out missing variation. And we've been trying to look at trying to recall that, but then the variants that we find, they don't exist in the reference omen. They don't exist, the variants don't exist in the databases because they weren't there to begin with. So I think one of the first underlying assumptions is just what's your genome look like and what's your sample have. So don't assume the sex chromosome complement of the sample because it may not match the self-reported gender of the patient at all. And then the other assumption, which I, and I, and I forgot to mention this, is I think when we're moving to animal models, I often don't see people look at the sex bias in the human disease and how that's replicated in the animal model. For example, in rheumatoid arthritis, about 80% of people with RA are women, but in the mouse models, it's equal sex distribution. And this happens in many animal models. And so not that this is a pip, it could be really useful to figure out why is there a sex bias in human disease and not in the animal model. But we just assume this represents the disease we're looking at. And I think if we looked at the ways our assumptions are violated when it doesn't match, then we could try to identify the mechanisms better. I'm missing my tissue. 
I am interested in the heart mm. development mm. at around eight weeks, mm. right? Mm. And I'm not interested in mouse heart development, though I respect it as a process. But so how is it that I actually get to contextualize my variants, right? And so yes, IPS models are a huge advance, right? That can now study human genomes, human cells, as the cells differentiate. But they're still, you know, at best a co-culture of a couple. And there's some amazing techniques where you can put various cell lines together to try to minimize uh, environmental influences, right? To be very sensitive to small genetic influences on gene expression. Um, but I, we've spent about five years trying to get enough neonatal samples to even make headway on a pediatric heart atlas. Mm -hmm. um, and so even like not even talking about the tissue I'm primarily interested in, but something that's adjacent to it um, has been hard to, to fill in. And so I think for, for those of us who study diseases with a developmental origin, which I think is actually most people, um, I think we're a key repository is what is it, the ENCODE, the GTEx of, of human development. Um, and I think that there are essential things that just aren't uh, consistent across other species where having that reference would help us contextualize our variants. I think that uh, we can't assume that all genetic diseases are results of variation within the coding or even regulatory elements or intergenic regions of the genome. I think we have to keep in mind these repetitive arrays that actually do have important functions. Um, and they've been shown that you know expansions of arrays, for example, you'll hear later, uh, do cause disease. And so I think that one of the things we need to keep working on is trying to detect structural variation, epigenetic variation within these loci. And I think short read sequencing is not going to be the thing that does it. We need to do long read sequencing. We need to do it for many, if not all human genomes. And on top of that, when we align those reads back to a genome, we shouldn't just have one reference genome that represents all of us because we know that it doesn't represent all of us. I think, and we're going to hear from Eric Garrison later about pan genomes, but we should really be moving towards a pan genome that represents the haplotypic diversity we see in the human population. So we don't miss variants that are only present in one type of ancestry, um, not in the others. And so I think combination of long read sequencing, not excluding regions, not excluding the Y, um, and having a better reference genome will help us move in that direction. Oh, you want to go Okay. <clears throat> well, thanks for going first. You gave me time to think about this now. Um, if I think back when I, I'm in the diagnostic lab and we're looking at a VUS in a gene, I don't really know much about the function. I, uh, I keep thinking that the reason we got ahead in many areas, hunting disease, the shem free CF, is, is partnership with the cell biologists, the electrophysiologists, and others. And unfortunately, um, there's fewer and fewer physiologists out there or people training in those areas. There's fewer and fewer people training in some of those areas of cell biology. No genomics has become so sexy and interesting, but people are poured in now. We used to have trouble recruiting people into our field years ago. Genetics was Punnett squares and boring math. Now, people can't wait to go in it, and there's so much excitement. But unfortunately, they're not going into some of the areas we really need most, which is to plug away and doing some of these studies that are take months to yield a result, but they're essential. And you can't figure out the function of a protein with those kind of people. So I wouldn't say we're missing, but I would like to see that we the, we reach out more and coordinate more with people. That's why I mentioned proteomics because there's a great field that's expanding. But the cell biologists and those they when you call them or you want to collaborate, they usually jump at the opportunity, and we should take advantage of their expertise. And they've been spending sometimes a whole lifetime on one protein or a set of proteins. And so I'm wondering if there was a way we could, you know, within even a diagnostic lab setting, reach out within that context and say, hey, we got these variants. Is there a simple way to connect with these people and say, would you be interested in working on what the functional implications are in your system? Uh, something to do it by collaboration, but we don't have a system set up. So that makes it one at a time, takes quite a bit of, uh, you know, personal effort to get these things done. So, but if we had a more conduits or connections with our biologists and again, the physiologist colleagues, I think that would facilitate the, the functional assessment of, of these variants that we're, we're trying to assess. <clears throat> so I'm gonna take a hard turn from the genome to the phenome and say that I think that we are missing the uh, 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 
longitudinal aspect to the standard phenotypes that we collect. And I think that that starts at the beginning of development as a pediatrician, it's important to me. And then also during the natural history of the disease, I think that there are certainly studies that have followed people over time that have been very successful and fruitful. But I think that the standards like HPO terms and um, maybe some procedural framework to go around newer technologies like FINA packets really need to um, incorporate longitudinal information. And that can be fever periodicity, or it could be trying to capture the developmental patterns that as clinical geneticists, we know very well. Some diseases, they're easier to diagnose when the person's a kid. Sometimes they're easier to diagnose when the person gets older. And I think that that should be captured in our standard representation of phenotype, and we're not doing that. So as a bit of a follow on our models of our ways of looking things, um, incorporating or do, how do we move to a place where we're incorporating the repetitive, the organ, the right tissue, the, the longitudinal data, the disease, the modifiers. I think Gary, you had mentioned modifiers earlier and under putting all those pieces together, each recognizing that each of them is important and perhaps missing in how we're looking at things. How do we go from being reductive to having the long view back to something reduced enough that you can give it to a patient? Or an individual? If you know the, if we know the answer to that, Right, we'd be in great shape. I mean, it's, this is the challenge of this type of session and other sessions over the years that we've done. We've tried to attempt things with, I mean, to, to try to provide the information resources that get us further ahead. And and we've taken the technologies that work right now, the tractable ones, and we've tried to apply them as best we can. But the whole process of science is very imperfect and very uneven in its progress. So, in some ways, you can make rapid. Uh, movements in certain areas and we continue with that hammer to hit that nail right and it's great we've done it once we could start sequencing next thing was can we sequence the whole genome uh but now we sequence a lot of genomes then the question is what's next and how do we how do we go with it so I, i'm i'm not expecting that we're going to solve all of it by bringing everything up at once but certain areas the methylome idea with uh, for example uh with the ONT and other technologies, that's that's dissectable, tractable. Let's let's go for something like that that works. It's a robust technology, and find out what we can with that, and solve one part of the puzzle, even if it's for just a small slice of some of the diseases that we're working with. So, you know, I, I, again, it's the same thing when you sit there and review R ones. You go, what is tractable? What's what what kind of information are we going to get at the end of the day from the work that's being done? And so, I I, I always like the applications that indicate that we're going to get learn something each one of these. Uh, so aspirational, but not so aspirational, we won't get something out of it. Um, over the past year or so, I've been part of a gene curation panel for uh, ClinGen, and it's actually changed how I do science. It changes which experiments I think about including, it changes what I think about reporting, because now I've understood from the clinical genetics perspective, what is it that makes evidence translate to a potential diagnosis for a patient. Like I was uh, had said at lunch, we throw out tests done in hex cells. I think if more scientists did that, they might have found a cell line relevant to the disease state they were um, studying to report their variant function in, right? And that all of a sudden makes it the tissue you're interested, in, it makes it scorable. Um, and so I think there are actually some well-codified uh, uh, sets of criteria of what makes something relevant to a patient when you're studying a genetic condition. Um, and I think it's probably in part a process of making those perhaps integrated into how um, proposals are, uh, are designed by basic scientists doing some of that functional work or how the grants are reviewed. Because there actually is, there's a, <laughs> dozens of lovely papers about how to interpret variants in clinical settings. I think a lot of those principles just don't always make it back to the people doing the cell culture. Um, but it's not because there's not a desire to have those two things match. So I think we should continue down the road that Emerge and other projects established, which is to think about how to do this work in the context of how medicine is practiced and how medical records are stored and, you know, make this, whatever we decide next, practical. 
because I think it's going to be, it's always difficult to get a large unwieldy organization like healthcare to change direction completely. Whereas if we can kind of nudge it in a direction that's going to be more beneficial for, for data collection and um, implementation of new diagnostic strategies, that's going to be uh, hard, but in the long run, better and more fruitful. So realizing that you've each already sort of addressed this, um, at everybody's mentioned additional data types other than genomic data that, that you'd be interested in, in having. Um, but really thinking about what are the data types that are gonna be most useful for analysis of understanding the complexity of the genome and, and making relevant sense out of it. Um, you know, what's the, what are the key pieces of that? What are the barriers to getting it for you? I think we should absolutely be considering long read sequencing as a way to probe both the genomic and epigenomic content of a genome, capture large structural variants that are usually missed with short read sequencing, and to even get longitudinal data when we're looking at um, a patient over their lifetime. Um, there's many consortia who are currently generating long read sequencing data from diverse human genomes, which we're trying to build into a pan genome. And we also have efforts from the All of Us long read workshop or working group who are generating uh, long read sequencing data from, we've already have like 1,017 individuals sequenced and planning to have 10,000 more with the goal of trying to link that genomic data, epigenomic data um, to their phenotypic EHR medical health records um, and try to bridge that together. So I think I think definitely that should be um, a player in the game. I think I think moving back to the data sharing and making data findable and accessible and interoperable. <laughs> I think there. What I see is a right. Like I'm like a little fish in a little pond, right? And I see a lot of other little fish doing little things, and and I see big fish in in big ponds doing cool big things. And you know, and then I come in with my little fish ideas, and I can work with them, right? Yeah. And so, how do we create schools? And how do we continue to as as large consortium or large projects or publicly funded, privately funded are, are making these available, how do we pull in communities? And I see this being led by, for lack of a better word, benevolent dictators, right? Who have access to these resources and, and the ones who do this really, really well, pull in people and say, we have this data and here we're gonna give, you know, what do you wanna do with it? And then farming it out to many, many people who have these many ideas, I don't, you know, we're starting to do a lot of work in the placenta, which is really important developmentally, but it's should not be that hard of a tissue to collect. It really should not. And it is exceedingly difficult, right? I mean, because like babies don't come when you want them to, and people don't want to work 24 seven. And like, <laughs> you know, like in the moment, people have other concerns. And so, and so there were a lot of labs who are slowly and painstakingly gathering these data. And what we're trying to do is build a network, but I, I don't know how agencies could facilitate that without putting in too many roadblocks, right? Like saying you have, you must do this. And I don't know. And I think we could learn from the patient participatory networks, right? Where patients are self-aggregating, but could we think about ways that researchers or funding agencies could model that among the broader scientific community? That wasn't really a great answer. It was just, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> really great answer. I can't emphasize the importance of registries of individuals for uh, long, particularly longitudinal data. Um, uh, certainly, the development of drugs for cystic fibrosis and several other disorders have uh, have been moved ahead more rapidly because the companies could see they had the natural history data. The FDA is now accepting um, through CF and a few other disorders now cell based results in order to certify drugs and expansion of the label of the drugs because it's already got the clinical trials conducted on a, a set of patients. It doesn't have to be huge. In some cases, it was only four or five variants and about 50 people. But once you had other metrics or other representations of the illness itself, and we could use the cell lines or other representations, then expanding these drugs and moving ahead was, was much more simple. So, so I, I, 
So I, I think that we have to sort of think a little bit more ahead about where we're going with all this. Why are we doing what we're doing? At the end of the day, what we're doing, why we're doing is because we're trying to help the individual with the disease. And usually helping the individual with the disease means we correct the variant that causes disease. We replace the gene that's defective, or we find a bioavailable molecule that can correct the protein in some way or replace it. So if that's our goal, right, at the end of the day for the treatment, I think that's what National Institute of Health means. So... Uh, you know, we have to keep thinking what is some of the most key components and the, the, the registries that give that kind of information, give you the metrics so you know if the drug is successful or partially successful, what does that look like? And what kinds of things and outputs do you need to, read, to show that it is successful, whether it's cell line based or whether it's uh, metabolomics or something else? Uh, you need to have those kind of things and you need the natural history as well because the FDA will want to see improvement in clinical features. It's not good enough just to correct it initially in the cell line. You've got to actually show it improve something like their lung disease. But once you've done that, they can accept these biomarker approaches. And other. There was a question, so I won't continue. So thinking about, go ahead. Yeah, please. I just want to follow up on a point from earlier. Like it seems quite tempting to go after a one size fits all uh, sort of a paradigm for testing, but historically we've never done that in clinical medicine. And I'm kind of going after some of the points that Gary and Melissa, you brought up, given the intricacies of the diseases that you study, is the one size fits all the right testing paradigm that we should be moving towards, or should we be more so thinking about, you know, how to guide diagnostic testing or how to guide sort of genetic diagnoses for a particular phenotype? And that should be what we should be trying to go for and move towards. Well, uh, how many diseases can you decide uh, to um, diagnose with like a, I don't know what they're called these days, like a hemate or something like that, you know, just looking at the blood cells, which was a smear that was actually not done in a lab originally, right? You do it yourself. Heck, I used to do your analysis myself in the ER on the kids and you could diagnose quite a few things. I'm just thinking when you say a common test or a common assay, it can cover certain things, right? You know, can't, can't sort of cover everything, but I think... Genomics covers quite a bit right now. It's a pretty good test. And I sort of see it in the same way, but it's not covering everything. So maybe that's not a good answer to you, but I'm trying to, can you elucidate a little bit more what you're thinking in that? I guess I'm trying to provide I mean, a counterpoint to this concept that we're going to be able to solve everything with some sort of long read multifunctional assay that's going to do everything simultaneously. And like whether or not that actually is the right paradigm, maybe it's a paradigm that does capture the most but really, when we have such deep knowledge about, you know, different disease states like cystic fibrosis, like congenital heart disease, should we be more so guiding testing based on those particular conditions when that is amongst our clinical suspicion? I think that's what we're doing clinically right now is we don't do a one size fits all. But I, I want to sort of like, you know, push a little bit against the sort of, I think, momentum to try to go towards that as the output. Well, I'll, I'll... I don't think, and if I have conveyed that a one size fits all approach is uh, appropriate, it's just that um, there are certain ways in which we can make advances uh, with certain technologies we really trust and can be robust enough to be used in a clinical situation. So sometimes we'll, like, and we'll take that hammer and find the nails that we can address with it. Um, it's not the best way to do it, it's kind of a singer sewing kind of approach to things. Um, but it does and sometimes advance in certain, helps us advance in certain areas um, by application of a common methodology. Um, but when it really comes down to individual diseases and conditions, we've heard already, they all have their nuances and their requirements. So I fully agree with you that in order to really resolve it, uh, you have to go deep. However, we also have to think about things that can have some breadth to them. Because for all the disorders that we work on, we all hope they have applications outside. And certainly a big thrust for us in, in cystic fibrosis right now is the efforts we're putting into gene therapy will benefit the entire group of individuals who have single gene disorders. I mean, that's, there's a lot of resources uh, the foundation has uh, come for a long story, and I won't have time to say about it now, but I'll tell you uh, later on if anybody's interested. But it has the resource to do it. And a key thing in, in their next stage was what can we do that would not only help individuals that have cystic fibrosis, but also any individual that has a genetic disorder. And so gene editing, gene replacement, all those came up. CF 20 years ago attempted to do this unsuccessfully with viral vectors, but 
they're back again. And hopefully with that kind of an approach of trying to take certain technologies and apply them across the board, we'll be successful. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe we'll find out CF, Sickle, and a few others, the only ones we really can treat at the end of the day. But I'm willing to give it a shot for a while. Anyway, I'll end that. I think it also depends on whether you're talking about the clinical or the research setting, right? Because when you're in the clinical setting, you all of a sudden need to worry about the time to return to results. You don't want a diagnostic odyssey. If it's going to be SMA and it's not on your state's newborn screening, then you better have deletion testing in whatever you're sending that first week of life, right? Um, and so I think uh, we're starting to get to the point where for certain clinical indications, there's definitely a best pathway, right? Um, and if they're, if reviewed by a clinical geneticist doesn't think you need to carry a type, you can probably go straight to microarray in, in many settings, right? Where that didn't used to be the case. And now if you have the right genomic platform and the right kind of private funding behind your clinical <laughs> setting, you go straight to genome or exome, right? Because microarray, you can get all of those data from our you know, many people in this room that have helped, uh, you know, structural variants be better detected through short read sequencing that we can skip to those. But I think we're in the expansion period right now, right? We're still in the wide. We're still just figuring out what there is to find. And I think it will then translate to better, more efficient clinical testing. Uh, and I do think, like you're saying, for some certain clinical indications, we have a sense of what's a waste of time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, don't wait for your microarray to come back if it's infantile hypotonia, because your chance of getting to have a directed therapy is worth the extra money to send for your rapid exome or genome. Um, and so we have those little knife edge cases that we can point out. Uh, but I think until we get better phenome, until we kind of are able to look exhaustively across the genome, mm -hmm. we're still wandering um, for so many of the different contributions to disease. Um, so as we're wandering this space and realizing that one size doesn't fit all, can we talk a little bit about how we should or perhaps shouldn't be thinking about ancestral diversity in our analyses? Anybody? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I certainly don't have an answer to this difficult problem, but I think that uh, building relationships with um, local communities um, seems to be the place to start. So, um, for instance, if you want to work with indigenous populations in Australia, and there's some wonderful work that's been done there, you engage that community and you work locally to try to understand what they need out of the process and what can be um, what infrastructure is needed to collect the data rather than trying to do that work from a from a distance. And I think that the needs in different communities are going to be different. It could be language needs, it could be um, infrastructure needs, it could be education needs. And we need, I think, as a community to come up with a process that's nimble enough that we can approach different populations and figure out what's going to work best to collect the the final product, which is data to help develop, you know, uh, standards for helping to interpret um, clinical results for that group. How much time do we have? <laughs> oh, great. All right, okay. we have 15 more minutes in this session. Uh, I think we sh should think carefully about incorporate when genetic background, right, is something, some of the coolest work, like showing causal variants not being penetrant when another variant is present is, it just, I think about it all of the time. I don't do that work, but I think about it all of the time because I think it's so incredibly important and relevant. And we are intentional in the work that we do to try to collect people from different self-reported racial groups. But I think we have to be really cautious when we're trying to incorporate when we said ancestral variation, you probably didn't mean like orangutan and chimpanzee. You probably yeah. meant like geographic ancestry. It's a variation of human populations around the globe. Although I think comparative genetics and genomics is going to be important here too. Uh, but we have to be really careful not to replicate racialized medicine and, and not say this is now representative. So we're finding that even in principal component analysis, your inference of where your patient or where your sample sits is highly dependent. I mean, not we're finding, we knew this, right? We knew this, but we just pretend not. But it depends entirely on the individuals that are in the reference that you're using to build your principal component analysis. So you can have these beautiful plots that look like they mirror European countries, right? We know that populations that have lived in the same place have geographic isolation by distance, and then you get 
subpopulations of variants that are happening there. And so I think we need to try to find some way to pull in the ideas of personalized genomics in into this and how combinations of variants occur in individuals um, are contributing to the disease outcome. But also, and we haven't really talked about this at all, so, and you didn't ask, but uh, social determinants of health are layering on, on top of this. And we know that individuals with very similar genetic background can respond differently based on their support structures, based on the stress that they're undergoing every day. So we think about gonadal hormones, but there's multiple other hormones uh, throughout the body and throughout the day and throughout people's months and lives. And depending on when during development, maybe their parents were stressed. I've never stressed as a parent, so I don't know what those studies are talking about, but I, 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 it gets complex in a way that I think we can handle. I really like this idea that we can handle it. We just have to be really diligent to not put boxes onto things that we don't have to put boxes onto anymore. I think the reference, the idea about the reference genome is a really good analogy. So we are moving away from the human reference genome into pan genomes. And I think as we're moving into health, we can think about these, well, yeah, right, multiple dimensions of people yeah. and how each of us is pulled in multiple axes and that those axes are going to change over time and we're going to fluctuate. That I mean, how do we do that? is by acknowledging that those axes exist. That's how we start to do that. Melissa, well, so you've set me up so beautifully for this next um, question, which is really we are not just a genome. We are a collection of genomes that changes over time and does not change the same way depending on what is going on around us. Um, and so thinking about both somatic and epigenetic influences as we go through our life um, is, is a part of that complexity. And are there things that we can start to do that will help disentangle some of that very complex uh, landscape you just laid out? I, I mean, I think the coolest thing is looking at how just even just loss of whole chromosomes as, yeah. as people age. I think we don't have... We don't yet, but as we get to this, you know, we could look at GTEx even with long read sequencing, fully assembling diploid genomes and looking across. We're not going to have longitudinal samples from every tissue in the body for the same person. It's just not feasible. And I like sometimes I just had a conversation with a student. They're like, we we're looking at brain samples across ages, right? You know, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s from GTEx. And they're like, are any of these longitudinal? Hmm. Hmm. No, no, they're not. And we're not going to get there, right? We can't. We can never have that. We can never have. Not even in animal models, right? We cannot have the same piece of heart over time from the same individuals. But we can start to look at it, and we can generate these references. So, just learning about this developmental GTEx data set, where we can see what are the trends, what are the trends in tissues over time, just in genome structure. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really cool open question that we could get at in the next five to ten years, and try to figure out how genome is the structure of the genome is changing from conception through development, through aging. Yeah, and I'll follow on that and say, I think that we should eventually have our own personalized genome that serves as our reference genome for ourselves. And it would be cool if we could do single cell sequencing to understand the variation in our cell population at a given time point, do longitudinal sequencing to then understand development, aging, how it affects on things. I, I also think about tumors that develop in the microenvironments that exist in the tumor versus in the rest of your healthy tissue. I'm not sure how we'll eventually be able to detect that before it happens, but hopefully we can in some way. So I think that the, the idea of using long read sequencing to build these reference genomes for ourselves, that then we can then monitor our own genome progression, change in structure, epigenetic variations, even, even you know, cell to cell variation would be a really great goal for us. Just one of the things I always think about is, um, so we use, you know, when we were looking at mosaic variants, we used a pipeline from a lab across the street 
because they'd found in their brain samples just huge amounts of mosaicism explanatory of a large proportion of their cohort. Mm -hmm. And we looked and we had less than 1% mosaicism and it was explanatory in none of our cohort, right? Yeah. Um, and it just made me think about the difference between heart and brain. Like, is it really just that one's replicating and one's not? But what made each of these tissues so uniquely differential in their mosaicism? Which also I think just brings up the question, like why does it happen in some tissues and not others? Um, and is that, is it, um, is it just replication? It feels like it's something else too. Well, it's just an interesting paper in Nature uh, about how our organ systems may age sort of differently than us. A little worrisome, isn't it? Um, and we, but we certainly know of examples for the brain, for example. Uh, you may be physically fine, but the brain has unfortunately advanced since aging. So, but I'll come back to a theme that's been uh, brought up at various times. If you want to learn about that, you have to uh, follow people for a long period of time. And the Framingham study was incredibly valuable. It's unfortunately stopped by NHLBI. I'm not blaming it much. It was expensive. But what a valuable study that was. And there's other octogenarian and aging studies out there. We want to learn. We have to studies and study humans. And we have to spend the money. But I know from prior efforts, uh, there hasn't been a lot of support always at the NIH for paying for those kinds of studies. And and despite some vigorous uh, arguments uh, about the value of them, the, the feeling was, well, they're not really hypothesis driven, they're data collection, and you know they're going to take years and years to, to, to acquire, and this could be through multiple you know, five-year funding cycles and so forth. But I think if there were commitments for longer funding cycles and commitments to do this, uh, it could be done if we want to do it. And many of us could be our own study subject, enroll as we do, and participate as we want to, and share in this endeavor. It's for all of us, not just for one of us, or for a subset of those who happen to have illnesses. So uh, again, big fan and advocate for these phenotype databases that are essential to understand where we're going and what happens to us over time. Okay, so I have a question up here. So we've been talking a lot about how complicated everything really is in real life. Um, but presumably when you get data from an individual, your first pass and maybe even your second and third pass through that data is assuming sort of the conventional things that it's probably one gene with an inheritance pattern that you kind of are assuming and it's probably in a coding region and it probably is easy to tell, but we know that like more than half the time that's not it. So do we need uh, to approach the question differently from the start? Do we need new tools or new ways to do that first pass data so that we're picking up more things? Or is the answer just then you have to do a lot more of this, what sounds like boutique kind of approaches to each case, each case, each case. Like what is like the way that we can sort of make the first pass more effective? Well, this is sort of parroting medical dogma, but I think you want to start with the most specific thing that you can until you get far enough into the, your list of possibilities, your differential diagnosis that you start to need to broaden out because it's more, it's more efficient. I think, you know, if I suspect something is going on and I can diagnose that with a single inexpensive test, I should start there, I think. So, you know, I, I think that what I imagine is going to develop over time is a, is a, it's a layered approach and we're sort of work, the cutting edge of that is now we're in an era where there are just so many possibilities for deep follow-up for clues that arise from those early steps of the diagnostic journey that we need to figure out how to use those efficiently and how to fund them and create infrastructure for them. Yeah, I almost worry about the opposite more often where you're reviewing a paper where they identified um, trisomy 21 and 10% of their cohort and then included those 10% when looking at like common variants that had a 5% effect, right? And we're trying to double count some of those. Yeah. Um, so I actually think it, and you know, is it is it that we I diagnosed all of these other coding and aneuploidies because they were so obvious, but it's also because the effect size is large, right? And they're yeah. penetrant. Yeah. And so I feel like you actually do always want to do that as your first pass because you, then you don't want to include those participants unless you're doing a modifier analysis, right? Um, and so I actually think it is the right thing to do when you first go through. Uh, we definitely, you know, out of our 14,000 people we've done exomes on, we 
diagnosed trisomy 21 in about 50 people. It was not the most cost effective way to do it. Um, but then, mm -hmm. you know, once we knew that, we could then do other studies with those data, but they needed to be excluded for finding any candidate novel disease genes, right? Um, so I actually think that one of the things we need in all these biorepositories is an annotation, causal variant or not. Mm -hmm. likely explain you know likely explanatory variant because otherwise you could be looking in cases that are actually reducing your sensitivity and reducing your power uh, because they're not going to have the type of uh, signal you're looking for uh, because they already actually have another explanation present well cost is also the big driver because you can argue that a stepwise approach in a differential diagnosis makes most sense it's efficient it's been shown many times that algorithms have been put together to filter through what this did, what conditions and what should be done and there's lots of books out there so there's a blue books and everything else for cancer but but the, the cost really drives it so if a whole genome sequence at a clinical level comes down to $100 that's cheaper than most everything else you can do and if a, you can get long read sequencing for another couple of hundred dollars, then maybe you start out with a whole genome sequencing because you pick quite a few things up, particularly if it's done rapidly. And then you would add the next one, maybe long read, and maybe you do an answer, add on a transcriptome and maybe a proteome. And I can sort of see how this molecular cell level interrogation could occur in the same way. I can start out with an X-ray of the hand. And if I'm not sure if there's a fracture there, I can do several other assays. I can actually inject things to see if there's actually osteoblast, osteoclast activity, to see if there is a minor fracture. I could do a CT scan, I could do an MRI, you know, more expensive assays, but you filter down to them. So we could see sort of some of these other diagnostic approaches used in medicine, and we could consider them as uh, templates for how we might proceed. And again, if the cost is come down, if it's 10000 to do a whole genome, that's one thing. If it's a hundred or a couple hundred dollars, then we're talking the same range as a chest x-ray. Just to follow up on that. Okay, Sorry, I just want to follow up on that. Um, I'm curious to hear the panel's um, thoughts about how phenotyping plays into diagnosis, because I know there's been at least a lot of experiences in the past where maybe a patient comes into the clinic with a prominent feature and a different patient maybe sees somebody else with a different prominent feature and they are actually the same diagnosis, but they come up as different in, in the um, recruitment, I guess. So your, your thoughts? I, I would just say that that has been an interesting feature of this sort of reverse genotyping where we don't discover something until we do the sequence and then we realize, oh yeah, this phenotype is much broader than I thought it was going to be. So I, I, I don't know what clever I have to say about your question actually, but I think that that's been a very interesting trend in the last uh, few years since it's been easier to get those those technologies. So is there is there like a better way to see all the phenotype of a patient, at least when you're trying to make a diagnosis? Um, for that individual, whether it's from the clinical perspective where you maybe know the gene and you want to make sure that there's some additional features that would kind of make it this diagnosis versus this diagnosis, you know. The, the range of phenotypes associated with, with just monogenic disorders is huge, right? So it runs from the exceedingly mild features, really difficult diagnostic dilemmas for the docs and all the ways down to florid obvious cases that most medical students can pick up. Um, but, uh, you know, on occasion, as you say, there are situations because physicians aren't always, uh, at the same level of training, there's greater variability in physician ability to pick these things up than there is when you do a sequence, the sequence is consistent. It's, it's, it's a nice output, just like a chest X-ray. It's a nice output standardized, whereas the physicians aren't standardized. We, we're very fallible and we do make even bad mistakes on something that was rather obvious. I think of a late diagnosis, late, it was three months old, on a kid with Down syndrome. I, I was pretty sure the child did not have Down syndrome because there was no hypotonia. There were very mild features, facial features, and a few other things. But I thought, no, if I look at the standard criteria, the 10 standard ones, that key one that I've always seen in a patient was not present. But three months of age, I had to tell the patient, the parents, we did a care attack because when I saw him the second time, I said, oh my goodness. You know, and you think you know everything sometimes, or you think you're pretty well informed, I'll say that, and you get surprised. So sometimes a test that's standardized thing can be quite useful as an initial screen and a reassuring one. And then I'd also say the other side of the coin, we talked a little bit about this at lunch as well. When you're sure of something, a physician can never be sure enough. 
because <laughs> I still have people who request to sequence a CF patient. And I go, why? Well, you want to be absolutely sure they carry variants in that gene because you're going to treat them the rest of their life with that particular condition. And so sometimes the physician wants additional layers of confidence regarding what they're treating and how they're treating it. So I can... I, I wish there was a sim actually a simple answer to that one, uh, but there isn't because physicians will do lots of tests and sometimes with very low yield, less than 1% diagnostic yield. For us in genome sequencing, we'll be, oh, you're only getting 30%, 40%. That's fantastic for some tests, right? For, for a lot of uh, tests we do in medicine, they're nowhere near as good diagnostically as genome sequencing in certain circumstances. That's because it's complicated. <laughs> one last word, Sarah, because we've got it in the session. Do you have one more thing? I think that that's the importance of having patient groups present too, right? Or uh, <laughs> having uh, family groups and affected individuals be present as well, because what's going to be the defining thing that brings you to a doctor will be different depending on your social con context, what's expected of you, what's your role in society. Um, and so I think actually that's part of making our community broader so that we can um, get you know, phenotype information, if you want to call it that, or kind of lived experience information uh, that can really help expand our phenotype. A whole other layer of complexity. All right. Can we give our panel a round of applause? And I'll just say we're going to take a 20 minute break now. So we'll be here at 2.35 to talk about function, linking variants to functions.